So welcome to the movie book club. That was the main theme from Snowpiercer. Uh, James, oh, yeah. uh, I asked you to watch this film for this show. Yes. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it before we go into our deep dive, as we're accustomed to. Yeah, yeah, totally, Dave. Uh, it was a really, really interesting film. I suppose uh, uh, as an uh, overall view of it, it's, it's, it's a movie concerned with... Uh, climate change it's a movie concerned with the class system it's it's i mean it's it's an obvious allegory yes for what's happening on earth right now and the potential fallout that we could uh, endure as it goes on um the the the, the, the whole it, it, for the listeners at home it's basically uh, the end of the world has happened and anyone that's left on earth that we know of is living on a train and the train is really, really laid out like the class system. Yeah. Right? Where, where literally the lower class uh, are at the back of the train. Uh, as you move, you get to the middle class and you get to the upper class controlling elite. But overall, everyone is still in jail in the train. Yeah, yeah. That's something I kind of forgot about while watching it. Because like when I heard about this film in concept, I thought, oh, yeah, class system, rich people at the front, probably at the back. I'm like, that's really basic. This is probably going to be a pretty basic film. But I don't know. It's like the devil's in the details or like the implementation. I feel like the film is implemented really well. And uh, like that makes up for maybe like a kind of a basic idea, just like good shooting, good sets. Yeah. Like, good scenes um yeah there's a great exactly and what what actually defines we'll say the sections of the movie as go along obviously is the colors that are used the tones but the, but the light in the sense of the light from the outside in the back there are absolutely no windows none they never see outside for them the train is the whole world like like people love to keep saying throughout the whole film uh, what, what, the train is the world, isn't it? Uh, uh, can, in, I have, in the can, whole, I have, can I have anything in the whole white train? In the whole white train, exactly, Dave. So, so for the, for the people in the back, yes, absolutely, it is their whole world. We and also strangely, and not jumping ahead, but just overall, and the very rich people in the front who were at discos and raves and food, uh, the train is their whole world as well because there are no there are no windows. Yeah, there's no windows even the, when you finally not that I'm giving away anything when you finally get to the very front of the train there is no windows either. The only I didn't place, notice that. Yeah, yeah. The, on, the only place that there are windows in the middle of the train. The middle class are the only people that get to see outside uh, in the classrooms. Yeah, uh, in the arboretum. I never noticed this. Yeah, <laughs> so, so there is only one section of the train that you get to see outside. That's the middle class, and in a strange way, the middle class are the people when you kind of get to realize what this movie really is about. They're the ones that fuel the complete train. Yeah, you, you know, but but uh, just to go into kind of an overview uh, situation before we get into our our, our plot exactly. step by step. Snowpiercer is a twenty thirteen, you could call it oh, sci fi yeah. film, um, and it's interesting production wise because it is a. South Korean funded film yes uh, that was filmed in uh, the Czech Republic yes uh, so the whole film was apparently shot in Prague and they constructed like a gigantic practical uh, train set with like a hundred ton gimbals to like they did. simulate the move because you can see uh, when they're looking down the length of the train that the carts are moving yeah and it's not just like a sound stage somewhere would, yeah it really is nice or, or it isn't basically uh, the original Star Trek where everyone's like moving left to right themselves yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> trying to shake the camera <laughs> and give some atmosphere to the whole thing uh, no yeah that really does work well Dave yes certainly the set design the way it's designed is great I mean even well, we start in the in, 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 we start in the back of the train, and even like it had it, it had a uh, hints to me of uh, uh, Metro Last Light, uh, Metro Redux, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that video game, J- just that absolute grittiness, and then and and even the attention to detail, even the idea that in the back of the train, uh, in a strange way, maybe like the, the director Bong uh, Bong Joon Ho was try- trying to hint to us is that they use everything. Yeah, there isn't one thing they don't use in the back of the train. Uh, e- even the simple thing of the barrels of oil becoming uh, little rooms for newborn babies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, great touches, great touches. And I, there's always a thing I have in the back of mind when I'm watching films like this. I, I have two like running lists, and one is like the lists of uh, post-apocalypse that worlds are set in. Yeah. So this is obviously a climate apocalypse where. Yeah. Uh, the world is getting too hot, so they tried to artificially cool it with chemicals. Yeah. And they went too overboard, and basically the world froze. Exactly. Um, and that goes along with other things like, you know, you get the robot apocalypse and Terminator. And yeah. You get the uh, nuclear apocalypse and Mad Absolutely. Max. Absolutely. And you get the agriculture apocalypse and Interstellar. I'm always just running this list. How many apocalypses can you do? Zombie apocalypse is a big one. Zombie apocalypse is massive, yeah. Um, and we've had a freezing apocalypse anyway before a couple of times. Uh, the, uh, uh, day the after wor- tomorrow? Day after tomorrow is right, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, the one coming to me now. I, I had them written down in the paper, but there you go. But uh, yeah, so, so yeah, the world basically, as far as we're concerned, 
has ended and that anyone who survived is just on this train. So we believe that this is all of the population of the world. And, and another strange thing about the film is obviously because it is a train, the, the whole, the movie itself, the action in the movie itself is completely linear. Yes. In the literal sense that it's linear. Yeah. And, and, and the truth is that the only way to get out of this world is a lateral move, almost like lateral thinking, that if you move perpendicular to the train, you, there is another option. Right. As far as they're concerned, it's the option of death because we see it in the school children where they basically indoctrinate the middle class to believe that if you go outside... You all you freeze and die. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Dave. Yeah, I know. So most disturbing school teacher that ever lived. That was... Uh, really. Actually, disturbing when we get there. So we went, sorry, yeah, if, we go, if we go into it sort of the, the plot-wise, so the info dump is obviously that the world has ended and all the survivors are on this train. Mm. Um, and then it immediately cuts to 17 years later. Yes. Uh, so what we're seeing then is kind of the life of the tail section. And it's very, it's very... And then he's going for that whole thing, Dave, like we were saying, because... It is like a social commentary film, even maybe more than a science fiction film. Yes, of course, it's got science fiction elements, uh, is that he made the future very close. Yes. So it's one of those classic uh, uh, sci-fi films that it's a near future. So it's only 2031. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It didn't take us very long before we froze the Earth and then we just sort of time skipped to slightly later. Yes, yes, totally. Because uh, uh, freezing the Earth could be a solution we have for the problem we have now because we do have a problem now that the, the Earth is heating up. So yeah. this, this could, you know, it's not likely, but this could be our future with just like randomly frozen immediate ice age. Yeah, I suppose it's more as well. It's not even the randomly frozen ice age. I suppose it's uh, th that beginning of that film, the whole idea that it was, what was it? It was CW7 was some chemicals so that they uh, yeah. seeded uh, the sky with that and then it froze everything I suppose his comment there kind of in a way is that we our solutions will always be pathetic in the face of nature <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you know in the sense that when we believe we understand what's going on we usually don't understand such a massive system uh, of chaos so that our intervention usually resets the system in a way that's unknown to us you know, so that we try to bring it down gradually, obviously, yeah, but we kind of killed everything we believe anyway. Yeah, and the uh, the sort of the life of the tail section as we see is that they're regularly ordered to sit down in groups of five yeah. so that the guys at the front can count them with little clickers. Yeah, they do. But we don't really know what that's about. We will find out later. Yes, and def. we also see that the front takes from the back whatever they want because they come back and ask if anybody can play a violin. Yeah, yeah, And there's yeah. two old people there who are apparently like first chair of the London Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. there's a great moment where you can tell the guards and the, the people at the back don't see things in the same way no so he says to the guy you know okay let me see your hands all right come up the front yes and the guy goes well me and my wife both play like we both play yeah, yeah exactly he says and she's she's almost better yeah, than i am yeah and 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 he goes like just you and he goes not 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 both yeah and he goes yeah obviously bring both of your hands like yes yeah i know <laughs> no yeah. care no, about no the little care. interhuman relations no no exactly it, well he didn't he doesn't care about their interhuman relations and what what's uh impossible horror. and then and even that it, it kind of cuts quickly i'd love to know if there wasn't a slightly extended scene for that because they smash his wife in the face and then they stamp on her hand when she's yes. on the ground but it's just a very very quick cut you know, he doesn't really like uh, linger on it too long, but it did happen. So in the idea. Yeah, I would like to see if there is a longer cut of this, I would yeah. really like to see it. And then you sort of see what the life of the back of the, the train is like. Yeah. Um, there's a young lad played by Jamie Bell. Yes. Um, and the main character is Chris Evans. Yes. Uh, which uh, the reason I watched this film, the reason I watched this film, I'm a big Chris Evans fan. Yes. But uh, Jamie, Chris Evans is great. Jamie Bell is asking Chris Evans. Uh, Jamie Bell is he, really good in this movie. He is. Yeah. And he's doing an Irish accent in this. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Which I don't know how he got that because there didn't seem to be any other Irish people on the train. No, I, I, they were <laughs> going for that thing though, Dave. Uh, when they initially, uh, not even to jump ahead for the people, but uh, you got yellow coat girl turns up who turns up later on in the film. Yeah. Again, but then you get that older woman who turns up with the glasses and the fur coat, uh, and and uh, she does get them speaking to them in multiple languages yes so maybe that's where they're trying with jamie in the sense of to bring in the irish as well yeah yeah, yeah. so sort of like a, a refugee vessel um mm. and they're just we see that they eat protein blocks which yeah. look like kind of bricks of black jelly yeah they do yeah and, really uh, tower like things jamie yeah. bell is asking chris evans if he remembers the smell of steak yes and yes, Chris yes. Evans is like, uh, it's better not to remember these. It's better to forget the world outside because, like, you're yeah. only going to torture yourself with yeah. trying to remember what steak yeah. tasted like. Because he even says, like, do you remember what the smell is like wafting through and yeah. what, what's it about? Yeah, he, yeah. Because he, they, they have, they go, do they go meet John Hurt after that then, Dave? Uh, John Hurt, yeah, John Hurt's around, yeah. Uh, exactly. But what they're doing first is that there's a kid running off with a protein block and they're trying oh, to, yes, they're trying yes, to get it one. off of him. And Timmy. 
Yes, that's when they use the phrase in the whole wide train. It is. Cause he, uh, and it's good. I like that stuff with, um, you know, you, you need to hear about like show Bibles where like, you know, you know, only do this with this character, this character never do that. Like nobody ever references the world. People only ever reference the train. Yes. And I like the consistency to that because it shows what you were saying that like their thinking is very confined yes. to yeah, the, the class structure in the train. It really is that there's nothing outside it and there's no other, not that there's only hope, but there's nothing at all else that yeah. this is the world now. And people, and, and exactly, and this shows again that people are starting to forget and that they believe that this really, really is the world. You, yeah. You know? And um, what, what we find out then is that someone from further up the train is passing messages down yes. inside the protein blocks, inside the metal capsules. Yes, red and letters. Yeah, the red letters. Yeah, and, re and red letters as well. I was actually just thinking of it there earlier on. Red letters in Roman times uh, were on their calendars. They would have a red letter in the calendar. Yes. Yeah. So that was the important day. Yeah. 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 So um, and that actually just a slight tangent here uh, from Disney's Aladdin, the whole new world song when uh, Jasmine sings every moment red letter. I was convinced for my entire life she said every moment gets better because yeah. every moment red letter make no sense to me ever yeah. until I looked up and found out yeah let's think about the Roman calendar. It's the Roman calendar. Yeah, <laughs> Bringing yeah, it certainly. all together in the uh, in the snow piercer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this is. Yeah, so they're looking for that exactly Dave. They're, yeah. They're, and then the little boy which which is a nice touch basically the little boy acts as our eyes through the lower classes. Yeah. So in following and trying to chase this little boy to get his protein bar, then we get basically a whole kind of tour. Yes. Of, of, of what the lower classes and are the like. bunk beds and the barrel yeah, beds yeah. And, and everything. And different levels and how he get up there and he's very agile. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. class. And uh, they end up get, getting the protein block off of him by agreeing to let him play with a ball. Play with for the a ball. Whole oh yeah, it's the ball. The it's ball. not even a ball. Exactly, it's the ball. And then we get just a tiny glimpse of the ball and it's basically like it's worse than a ball from the 30s in Ireland <laughs> yeah. or something. It, it basically, and again, you know, it hints again to these people. It, it, in a strange way, the ball dehumanizes them again. Yeah. Because the ball is a large ball of twine. So these are like pets yeah. to the people up the front. I mean, you, you throw a large ball of twine to a bunch of cats, you, you, you know, uh, feral cats. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so the ball, again, not only the little boy, yes, he, he, he wants to play with the ball because he's a child and we believe it will humanize him. But when you get to see the ball, it's just another form of dehumanization. Yeah. And he doesn't even think to ask for the ball to be his. He just asks to get it for like a whole hour or yeah. something like some yeah. really ridiculous small thing. It um, is. Yeah. Yeah. Like a child would. Um, and then we get our next our next touch of the front where the yellow woman comes down. Yeah. The yellow woman, which and which really stands out. Obviously. Yeah. You, you, everything is like black and yeah. brown and really, like everything dirty. dirty. Everything is really dirty. They, yeah. they don't have showers. They don't get to wash. You know, even when he said, let me show your hands, your man, the violinist's hands look just so old and damaged. Yeah. But yeah, it, obviously then someone who's bright, clean and coming into it, it really shines out. Yeah, yeah, she almost looked like she was going and she like measures children. Uh, yeah. And we don't really know why. And there's yeah. a moment where Timmy, who we met, is hiding in his mom's coat. Yeah. And, uh, and she lifts, she lifts up, she, she looks at the children, they bring all the children forward. Then they're measuring them for yeah reasons unknown. And when she lifts up the mother's skirt, she sees the ball first. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the ball that gives it away that's yeah. a good touch I yeah. didn't actually spot that the first time yeah. and uh, they take away the kids and um, I forget his name but um, there's an actor who was in Train Spotting. oh he's brilliant who Spud. played six, oh is it Spud yeah, yeah he played Spud, he played yeah, Spud. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember his name either he's an absolutely magnificent yeah. actor but they take his kid and he's annoyed with them and he throws his shoe he does he and does. hits the yellow lady square in the forehead she starts bleeding and this sort of becomes shoe gate within the lore of it, the film it really does I, I, and, it, I, and it is that other uh Again, the, the movie hinting at what's about to come up to you because there is that famous saying, uh, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. So, so you're waiting for things to cop on. You're waiting for people to realize, listen, one shoe is down, when the other shoe drops, it's game over. Yeah. You know, so that, yeah, that shoe in a strange way was the beginning of, of, of the, I mean, we know that we know there's a revolution coming of some sorts, the way uh, uh, Captain America is talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that shoe is certainly the first uh, 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 shot we'll say of the revolution yeah uh, and yeah, uh, yeah and he's he, he does a really great job of it and then the, the way they uh, dole out uh, justice is just horrific yeah what, what they do is they um, they look at an almanac and they determine that for this particular punishment they only need I think it's seven minutes yeah um, and then they um, put basically like an airlock thing on his shoulder yeah. and stick his arm out the side of the train yeah and it's even insane Dave that yeah that that, that book has got obviously body parts in minutes. Yeah. Once it takes because when you, after they do that to him, you you look around then more at other people and other people are missing 
from below the knee, other arms, uh, wrists. Yeah, so they have done this type of losing limb torture, yeah. which in like our world is so indicative then of the Congo uh, and of Central Africa, uh, where they use that as a controlling technique as well. Oh, my God. Yeah, really um, brutal. The, at this moment, uh, Tilda Swindon is introduced in a great role. Yeah. As a uh, minister Mason, and she gives a speech. Yeah, she's uh, and she's brilliant because she so doesn't look like Tilda Swinton. Yeah, she has like prosthetic teeth, prosthetic nose, big furry jacket, like ridiculous yeah. glass bottle glasses, yeah, like yeah. super thick. She and is a caricature of a person in that kind of role. Yeah, yeah certainly. Uh, we get a lot at this moment because it also introduces the uh, the mid bosses of the film, which are the uh, Franco the younger and Franco the older, who's like two lads standing there with sledgehammers, just two big dudes in suits. Yeah, dudes in suits have been a running theme of the films we've they spoken have. about, and, and again. Even like we learn more about those two guys, but even in that one moment, uh, you you see how strange their relationship is. Yeah, one of them is kind of almost cuddled up to the other guy, or yeah. lying with his head in his shoulder, like they were a, an old couple. It is unclear if they're in a relationship or if yeah. they're father and son, because there's also definitely an age gap between them. Certainly. Um, and uh, Tilda Swinton gives a great speech, basically talking about um, she puts the shoe that she was hit. She does, and, and, and just and even before we get back there, they have the, the yellow coated lady. When he does throw the shooter, he actually draws blood. He does, and then her strange reaction is not to scream, not to overreact, or not to do anything, but to just drink her own blood. Yeah, she like you wipes know? it with her finger yeah. and then licks it. As and like they're seriously making this woman sinister. Yeah, and she I don't think she just leaves the room then. She, she just leaves the room and then you have Tilda, like you yeah. said, Dave. Yeah. Um, and what Tilda says to them is that you wouldn't put a hat on your head. It would look stupid. Uh, yes. Your place is at the bottom like a shoe. And then she says to everybody, I am a hat. You are shoes. Yes, Dave. And she also gives us the bit of uh, yeah. uh, behind the scenes that uh, everyone yeah. in the tail section is a freeloader. Yes. They didn't pay for their ticket and that's why they're stuck at the back. Exactly. And, and yeah, yeah she, she gives that thing. Uh, she says, uh, this is not a shoe. This is disorder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you know, I, I, she, I, that was it. This is not a shoe. This is disorder. Uh, size 10 chaos. Yeah. This is death. <laughs> My God. That's I've never seen a brogue represent more like, you know, disorder than, than that. Yeah. yeah. It, it was amazing. Um, and she also adds to the, the mystery of Wilfred, who is apparently the guy who made the train. Yeah. She cuts to him for like uh, a speech. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't answer. So no. She's like, oh, OK, well, never mind. And then a, stra- a strange little thing that hit me there, right? like it's not to do with the movie, when she says, be a shoe. It's a famous saying by a cartoonist called Art Spiegelman. And Spiegelman always says, be a nose. Really? Yeah. And what he means is be a nose to get in there, sniff around, see what's going on. Whereas she means be a shoe in an oppressive sense. Yeah. yeah. And she does a hand motion, which is a little bit weird. She says yeah. everything in its proper place. And yeah. it almost looks like, to describe it, uh, audio, like doing a punch with your palm open. Yeah. And then closing your fist and then bringing it back to your body. And yeah. She says everything in its proper place. Yeah. I, was, I wasn't sure what, what that motion was. We'll about. understand what that means later. Uh, but yeah, it, exactly. it, is a, it doesn't look natural. It, no. You know, it, it, no, no. It, 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 it smacks. Uh, of some type of fascist uh, salute yeah uh, or some type yeah like, like a really bad secret handshake for a or, kids club like, yeah, yeah certainly, no. certainly we yeah. gotta we gotta come back to that afterwards but then um, the seven minutes are up they bring uh, yeah. Spud in from the the cold. the cold and you see that his arm is entirely frozen yeah it's amazing and, and the, the great sound effects when he's, yeah. when he's tinging his arm they, they put it on a block and they like they hit it with I don't know an like anvil a, he put it on an actual anvil an, oh wow they yeah. brought an anvil from they the front they brought an anvil from the front or else the anvil has been there the whole time as a reminder of what justice will be doled out that would you. make sense that yeah. would make sense and he, even again we'll say the director does that so they bring the anvil in and even his uh, sledgehammer he just has a kind of pendulum swinging in the camera before yeah. it goes on that, that whole marking of time again yeah and the sledgehammers are very big and the, the Francos are obviously like swinging them around like they weigh nothing so we're hinting as well that these guys are very very strong yeah uh, they smash Spud's arm he is screaming obviously and yeah, then he, we kind of we cut away we're, we're moving on to our next scene yeah and um, we'll get to that after this and we're back talking about Snowpiercer. My name's David Chee, and I'm here with James McAuliffe on Z103 Online. So then they're, the people on the tail section start constructing a giant long pipe. Yeah. Um, and we I, don't... Again, back to that whole... We go with Red Letter Day Roman thing. The pipe again looked like basically a Spartan battering ram. Yes, you know it did, and we didn't really understand what it was for. And this is also where they introduce. Um, no, but the, we would say, yeah, we didn't really understand, but we kind of had an idea. Yeah, because, because uh, Captain America does say uh, earlier. Yes, uh, yes, listeners, I am going to continue. Calling <laughs> Captain America. Uh, he, he does say earlier uh, when he's talking to John Hurt because we were introduced to John Hurt character yeah. before that about that the doors only stay open for four seconds. Yeah. So if you have watched films in your life. You will, <laughs> You will start to kind of put it together that maybe this is to keep those doors open. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is also where they introduce uh, Chronol. 
which is oh, yeah. a sort of narcotic in the tail section. It's a chronal, Dave, or chronos? Um, chron- I wrote down chrono. Looking it up officially, it's written as chronol. Oh, perfect. Sounds um, perfect. But uh, yeah, they don't say it that way in the film. No. As but, far as I understood. But that's okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's a kind of a narcotic. and um, Yeah, he, and he, Hart says it's made of industrial waste. Yes. Isn't it? And it's it, like a byproduct of the train. Yeah, and it's also highly flammable. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, from what we understand, people sniff it kind of like glue. Okay. Um, so uh, Captain America, Chris Evans, is getting this as a kind of currency for his uh, progression forward. Yes. Um, and there's he has a theory at this point that the guards who preside over them don't have bullets in their guns. Yeah, exactly. And actually, and just before we went to the break there as well, Dave, you were mentioning Tilda Swinton. And then the one time we... Oh, it's the first our first introduction to Mr. Wilfred actually just happened before that where she goes to the tannoy she goes to the intercom to yes. talk to Wilson but there's no reply yeah. it's interference yeah. so we kind of get, get interested to Wilson uh, actually kind of actually not even kind of our first introduction to Wilson is actually brilliant our first introduction to Wilson is him ignoring everyone yes yeah you know, which, which makes, is yeah, makes loads of sense he doesn't feel like this thing where yeah. someone threw a shoe is but worth you're his right, time but you're right Dave uh, yeah he does Curtis does believe that they have no bullets. Yeah. That those bullets were probably used up in the uh, last revolt. Yeah. And uh, he's got a quite literal uh, devil and angel on his shoulder. You got Jamie Bell on the one side saying, Curtis, let's go for it. And he's got Gilliam, played by John Hurt, on the other side going, don't, don't. We need we need to be yeah. sure. We need more time. Yeah. John um, Hurt was such a great actor. He was, we, yeah. yeah. We really miss him. He, yeah. was, he was great. And then he, he decides to... Uh, pretty much put his money where his mouth is is he runs forward he grabs the guard's gun he could have done it any other way but he puts it to his own forehead and pulls the trigger and he pulls the trigger himself yeah, yeah. Which, and which, which, which kind of in a way yes he had to go all in yeah. about his theory and then going all in that way is the total spark because he has visually shown every single person behind him there really is no bullets in these guns yeah and then when everybody realises there's no bullets that's when the revolt begins people yeah. start surging forwards yeah because also uh, Hart and him have a little discussion before that about Tilda Swinton saying uh, she says uh, uh, put down put down your useless gun put down your useless gun because uh, Tilda Swinton we, in the sense that we, we, Gilliam, Gilliam we start to realise is an important man yeah. in the past probably in the history of this train and also Gilliam as he walks towards her when she says to the guard put down that useless gun he's missing a leg yeah, and is he missing a, a hand? Dave? I'm not. I'm really not sure, sure but he, is, he, he, is, have a, he has a procession with him, and everybody in his procession is missing something. They are. I th- someone actually think has an umbrella hook for for for, oh, wow. for an arm. Yeah, I, I didn't think, spot that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, the they move the the pipe forward, and they manage to get it through the doors yeah. by like pushing it onto I think the cart that brings the protein blocks. Yes, and they manage to jam and get the doors open, and. They're stopped by a, 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 a mini boss, which is a giant man swinging what looks like a kettlebell. It really uh, does look like a kettlebell. <laughs> I thought the exact same. Yeah. They just come in his workout. Uh, and nobody can get near him. And this is when we're introduced to uh, Grey, who yes. is basically the tail section's mute, tattooed ninja. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Who it is hinted as that he, yeah. he might also be Gilliam's lover, yeah. that they're, they're like a couple. He was a little bit like the early Deadpool. Uh, in 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 uh, in uh, the Wolverine movie, yes, you yes, know what I mean—the yeah. kind of strange Deadpool that no one ever gets to talk about, yeah. a bit like Green Lantern. Yeah, that, that actually Deadpool kills himself <laughs> in Deadpool too. But but yeah, he reminded me of him a little bit, you, you know. But uh, yeah. yeah, and we see his ability because he runs along the pipe, he leaps into the rafters. Yeah, he does kind of a parkour yeah. move. He very parkour. He jumps onto the guy's shoulder, like stabs him in his heart oh, perfectly, like with his knife. Gray is a knife guy, and then like takes the keys out of the guy's pocket and like while the body falls away he's just effortlessly hanging there by like a couple of fingers yeah so we're like okay this this is a high level tail sectioner yeah i don't know how you develop parkour and ninja skills in a tail section yeah yeah like, it's it's very impressive uh he obviously did it and then this is when we're into introduced to our next character who um they unlock from uh i don't know is it like a cryogenic freezer it just looks like a regular drawer but his name is nam ku min su yes and apparently he's the guy who designed the security system of the train. Oh, yes, yes, of course. And, and actually, just, just before that, because it was actually really cool, because there was another character we were introduced to, which is almost, he's slightly outside the world. We're introduced to the artist. The artist. Oh, the artist, it, yes. It, yeah. When Tilda Swin is talking, everyone is watching her or not interested, but there's one guy who is totally interested, but he's the artist. Yeah. Because he seems to, I mean, he draws everything. It, to me, he, he reminded me of a court artist yeah yeah you know, that he, that's very similar style exactly very similar style that that's the only person who can actually communicate to us in a way and give us some semblance of the truth and then a, a t- touching part before we uh, get out of the tail section is uh, that the people who lost their children 
in that kind of robbery of them, he gives them all a painting, a picture. Yeah. So he gives Spud, who Spud has lost his arm, but he gives Spud a, a drawing of his child. Yeah. And then he has one as well for, uh, he has one for, for Tanya. Yeah, and he, he looks like a little, uh, like a miner with like a miner's lamp on his head. He does, Dave, yeah, he, he does. And and even, you're absolutely right, because I was actually thinking about that after, even his uh, miner's helmet is slightly cut and cropped, uh, a, a little bit basically, and the, the light in it is slightly upwards, a little bit like a beret that a French painter would have worn at the turn, oh, turn, very good. Yeah, turn of the century. Yeah. So even that they all look the same, their clothing does slightly define them as well. Yeah. Uh, especially Curtis's beanie hat totally defines what his character is. Yeah, and because he's a tail sectioner, there's obviously no colour in any of his paintings. He does it all with like charcoal or dirt or something. It's just... It is, yeah, you're black, right, Jeff. Black colours it on is. yellow paper. On yellow paper, or in, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and this is when we're sort of introduced as well to the concept of uh, that this train has universal translators because they start oh, to talk yeah. with uh, Nam about basically he, they want him to get them through the doors and yeah. he's kind of disinterested in it. He and, is. Um, you realise... <laughs> well, even the fact that he was asleep... It, it, yeah. In a cold storage, you know, where you keep dead bodies is really, yeah. He wasn't appreciative, but they do a thing where they speak into a universal translator in English and it translates it into South Korean. Yes. And then he speaks into it in South Korean and it speaks back in English. And they only do that a couple of times, but then they just move on. And it's like, from that point onward, do you assume that yeah. they're just cutting the bit where you hear the translator? Yeah, which is fine, which, which, um, which is good. And you need to be able to understand what Nam is saying. So they put in subtitles for him in South Korean. But as I learned, yeah. uh, if you watch this on Netflix, they don't subtitle him. Exactly. So you have no it. idea what this character is saying for any of the film. Yeah, which which is massive because he is pivotal. Yes. Not only is he pivotal, as, as like as we go on, Dave, and maybe you know, come back to this film again another day. Uh, I mean, he's ma- he's massive. Yeah. He's as important as Curtis. He is. He's. I, I would believe in the South Korean release of this film that this guy was the main guy on the poster, yeah, and, I mean, and Chris Evans was in the background. Yeah, yeah. As yeah, it yeah. tends to happen for English li- or Asian language films. Yeah. So fact. he he would have been the draw. Um, and then basically he he produces a, a scene I really like uh, a little thing with cigarettes in it and a couple of matches yes and he lights up and you hear everybody go oh my it, it was a scene I feel like was AD or in later people going oh my god I thought the last cigarette went away 10 years ago exactly and he just like takes a drag and breathes out and you see everyone in the tail section just inhaling his second hand smoke yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was excellent actually uh, it really was especially when we're in a country where we ban smoking first on the earth yeah you know yeah and uh, a little kid comes up and like basically steals his book of matches um, and yeah. runs off and uh, he basically says to them at this point that um, well he doesn't say to them he throws his other cigarette into the crowd and they start to fight over it yeah. he beats up Jamie Bell and takes the keys yes. and he unlocks a second one and he produces his daughter Yes. Um, so what he says is like I'll open the doors for you my daughter comes with me and we get two blocks of chrono uh, every door we open Yes. and that's the sort of agreement they have come to at this point that yes, they're going to exactly. go through um, another thing I really and like that do- and that daughter is going to be very important as well Dave like you say because uh, like we were talking earlier at the beginning of the of, of the show, uh, the idea that the middle classes get educated in the middle of the train. Yeah. And they receive an education. The, the, the truth is he's the only one educating that child. Yes. So she, in a strange way, she gets a true education where the other children don't get a real education. Yeah. And and, and as we go along through the movie, what, what they say about the outside world is markedly different than what he says to his child about the outside world. Yes. He's kind of giving her a bit more hope in a way that we could maybe fight through it as yeah. opposed to that everything will die out there. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I didn't I didn't spot that. Um, another thing we get as well um, is a thing I've noticed fairly similar uh, in other Asian media is that for no reason at all, it's never explained the daughter's clairvoyant. That's fine, move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah, this yeah. is an English language release, they'd have to go into the backstory of how she was exposed to a vat of radiation You're or whatever. You're so right. She's just clairvoyant. Yeah. Nobody dwells on it. Yeah. Um, I watched a film once called The Ring and the yeah. woman being haunted and she came to her ex-husband she's like, look, I know we haven't been talking much. I know we haven't got a good relationship, but you can communicate with the dead and see ghosts. So I have to come to you. That's never explained either. Yeah. <laughs> Asian yeah. films, people have superpowers. They really do, yeah. Uh, it, it, it reminds you a bit actually of maybe like Ireland in the 30s or 40s when people still believed in fairies and Pashogs and these yeah. type of things were more part of your life and, and more accepting about them but yeah they just do they just oh, go man, I would love it. to do I'd love to do a movie book club on Derby or get on the little people someday oh, my I would God. love to yeah, do that that movie is unreal yeah yeah, it really is insane when he's drinking like pochine out of that pony dressed as the biggest insult to Ireland <laughs> 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 yeah 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 that's an amazing film but uh, yeah so the thing that lets us know that the daughter's clairvoyant is that before the door opens she says nobody there yeah. and the guys are all bracing to have a fight with whoever's on the other side of the door the door's open there is nobody there they walk in and then this is a thing you mentioned earlier this is the first window one of the only windows we see in the whole train Yeah, and this is I think the first time many people in the tail section have ever seen daylight it would have been the first time all. ever 
Uh, I think their reaction to it would probably have been much more uh, blinding, but that's fine. Like we don't we don't need to blind our entire cast at the start of the film for the sake of accuracy. Yeah. Um, and people look out, and I think someone says, "A uh, cold, still cold, dead, all dead." Because they go past the city, and you just see the city is just like they a, do. Yeah. a skeleton of a frozen city. Yeah, it really is. Um, not much happens in this section, so they go to the next door, and before they open the door, the daughter says, "He's running." Uh, and then when the door opens, you do see that there's a guy jogging through the carriage and everybody kind of braces like he's going to attack them, but he's just jumping to grab onto a valve that he's not strong enough to pull himself. Yes. And this is where we find out that the protein blocks are made in this part of the train. And it's made by a guy who was apparently from the tail section who got taken forward, who they haven't seen since. Yes. Um, and it and com- we get a hint of that earlier on when they take the children. Yeah, and that, the violinist. That, that, uh, yeah, and the violinist. So, so the violinist, yes, gives us a hint that we'll say, yes, he's getting a good job. The children then, because the, the fact that they take the violinist to play music at the front of the section, then you believe they must be taking the children. It can't be a medical checkup. They obviously have to be taking them for some reason. Yeah. So yeah. then, like, exactly like you said, if anyone disappears, then we start to presume they are taken to do some work. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, we see that the protein blocks come out of the conveyor belt here, and everybody's really excited because they're getting them while they're still warm. Yeah. Uh, so they're eating them away, and um, Curtis finds another note in a protein block another red letter note red letter, yeah. and he goes up to have a look into the vat to see how the protein blocks are made and yeah. we see that it's made by grounding up thousands and thousands of cockroaches yes uh, so him and the artist see this yeah uh, they both kind of go to vomit and try and protect themselves and yeah. then Curtis leader that he is turns to the artist and goes you can't draw this yeah yeah that's very good yeah. uh, and the artist just kind of nods silently yeah. and also again though like we get back to about the real world applications Bong Joon-ho uh, also this happens no, completely normally. I mean, this that, that's a form of protein in a load of Africa. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 not even a load of Africa. Even right now in 2019, in your ready meals at home, uh, there's insects. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to know there's insects. It's just ground up brown protein. <laughs> Basically, it's a ba- it literally looks like a, a bag of beige uh, uh, dust. I mean, I've, I've seen it. Uh, I'd eat it I'm not picky <laughs> no it's protein you're not even going to taste it you're not going to know anything about it the one thing I was with say people into science fiction in general uh, and, and especially like social commentary science fiction there's a movie called uh, Silent Green yes yeah yeah, yeah Silent that. Green is the minute you see the protein it's almost bars, more famous for its plot twist than it is for the film itself yeah and the film itself is absolutely brilliant probably one of the finest scenes of two characters saying nothing to each other uh, in it was when they have that meal. Uh, anyway, it's another movie. Have, have, Jinx, have I seen a poster for Soylent Green that spoils that twist on the poster? Yeah, I think it did back in the day, which was moronic. Oh, yeah, moronic. But yeah, totally. The minute you see the protein bars, if you've ever seen it, you're screaming at the protein bars. Yeah. Soylent Green is people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. So I guess it's it's less bad that it's cockroaches. Exactly. That's exactly. <laughs> at least at least they at least it's exactly. not exactly they're not eating each other. Yeah. Well. Yeah, uh, and this is a moment where uh, we find out that they've got different terms and that the, the daughter is referred to as a train baby, which means that she was born on the train and has never seen the outside world. Excellent, yeah. Jamie Bell is a train baby and Curtis is apparently 100% 50-50. 100% 50 is the worst thing I've ever said in English but yeah but 17 years off of the train 17 years on the train yes and in uh, Curtis's mind yeah because you're right Dave because he, cause he, he remembers uh, say, uh, yeah you're so right because earlier didn't John Hurt say I'm a shadow of my former shadow yeah yeah, yeah so that yeah. he's totally but I, I, and, he, and even like you say because he does say to Jimmy Bell how far back can you remember can you yeah. remember your mother's face yeah yeah, yeah, yeah and he yeah, asked yeah. that and he, he can't remember his mother's face and, yeah. and uh, Curtis says that uh, he doesn't regard the time before he met Gilliam as being relevant. So he sort of sees himself as a new man from the moment he met Gilliam on the train onwards. Yeah. Um, so yeah, then the next part of this film is uh, one of my favorite bits. I'm going to play a little sound bit under here, but basically they go to open the door and before they do, the girl turns to him and goes, don't open it. Yes. Um, the sort of, the precedent we've had for the film up to this point is that the train beyond the tail section looks to be mostly abandoned yeah. we've gone through a few carriages we've just seen one guy yeah. so the assumption is that it will be like that for the rest of it and we're going to play a sound bed after this welcome back to Movie Book Club I'm David Sheehan I'm here with James McAuliffe so uh, the girl in Snowpiercer says don't open it yes. and they do open it and what they see in front of them is with yeah. amazing music of course it is just a cart Full of bavacla- balaclavaed men. Yes, who, who are who are men that used to be in the tail section? Oh, presumably, yeah. Well, presumably, exactly. I didn't think about that. And they all have axes. Everyone in the tail section is or in this cart is armed. Yes. And it's clearly this is the armed response that has been waiting for the tail section for this whole revolt. Exactly, and, and exactly like you say, Dave, because the fact there are no bullets, 
the arm response has to be melee. Yeah. You, you, you know? And it's just, like, I love this song. I love the, like, low and they are like low optimism that's present in it yeah and everybody kind of just fills into the carriage like it is and it's, it's very intense as well because their balaclavas have no eye holes yeah just mouth so that they're just feeding themselves and being weapons yeah uh there's some guys towards the end who have no mouths and only eyes but it seems like they only have a certain number of holes per balaclava anyway yes and then in a weird little ritual what they do is because you know food is incredibly scarce on the train they pass forward a trout yeah and the guys at the front they just bloody their weapons by just digging them into the trout and passing it around. Yeah, and, and again, also, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a show of power yeah. against the lower class people in the sense that we, we will destroy a piece of food that you've never seen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that you can't even realize. It's, I think it actually was a catfish. Right, yeah, yeah, a uh, catfish. Which again makes sense with the whole cat... Uh, 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 be, being a uh, with the ball of wool, ball of wool earlier and uh, being a pet. And there's a, a bit here now where uh, Chris Evans and Jamie Bell are going to give each other advice. Be careful. Yeah. You do. Yeah. It's like yeah, yeah. how careful can yeah, you be? I don't like? know how can be because because even the clothes they're wearing, Dave, is almost like a, 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 a coats that you'd wear at sea so that yeah, you don't get covered in water so that everything washes off. You can almost imagine they're going to get covered in blood very soon. Yeah, and uh, this transitions us into like the big action set piece of the film yes. where uh, it's just, it's a messy melee fight. Yes. Uh, there's, there's uh, uh, I'm trying to think here. Um, they, do, they do sort of the, the 300 thing that happens that like it goes into slow-mo for a bit. Um, Curtis very quickly disarms one of the guys gets his axe and he goes on like a Captain America-esque beating spree through and, everybody and um, almost a little bit too like old oh boy was that linear fight you, yeah you've got the captain going through it as well yeah yeah and um, uh, there's a bit where the the dark music that we had there kind of fades away and they go into like a slow piano and he's sort of slowly fighting his way through the, the train and in some ironic setup from earlier he's doing really really well he slips on the catfish yes and he's on the ground and uh, a guy nearly kills him. This is all in slow motion. And then Jamie Bell runs through the carriage, basically jumps and curls himself into a ball and like cannonballs the guy over. And that gives Chris Evans enough time to get up and like compose himself and fight. Um, and then there's a bit where the kind of, we see an Asian conductor character who we don't know a lot about, but yeah. he's he's been with it throughout. And he announces that uh, they're coming up on um, uh, ice blocks on the, the train. And this is where we see Snowpiercer could have performed its namesake where it smashes through giant walls of ice. Yes. Uh, we learn later that this is also how it gathers its water. Yes. Um, so everybody stops and sits down because like the train, it looks like it nearly derails at this it point. It really does. It, uh, and like, yeah, the tra- it, it's, it's, it's not humans again that we get that hint. It's nature that will defeat the train. Yeah. Y- y- you know, it, 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 like again, the humans and the train are all on the same journey. Yes. There, there's no one, there's no hierarchy really. You know, it's nature is the true uh, leader. And then there's a weird bit then where they say, Katarina Bridge is upcoming and everybody stops fighting. And then uh, all the guys with balaclavas and axes start going, 10, 9, yes. 8. It's really bizarre. They're covered in blood. Yes. Like some of them have missing teeth. And then when they get to one, they go, Happy New Year! Because <laughs> yeah. the train takes one year to do its rotation exactly. of the earth. And the Katarina Bridge is apparently where they celebrate New Year. Which is, yeah, which is absolutely crazy in the sense that it doesn't matter what's going on about you, you still will do that kind of thing that you're pre-programmed to do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the front sectioners build on this momentum by bringing out Minister Mason again, Tilda Swinton. And she gives a speech saying that, you know, oh, oh yeah. this insurrection will not be uh, viewed lightly. And yeah. um, then she finishes her speech by saying 74% of you will die. Yes. And uh, then... Because they know that you I mean like... I, 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 no one has told you explicitly yet, but you get it in the sense that you can't have a population explosion on a train. Yeah. There can only be a certain amount of people always forever and ever on this train. Uh, we kind of realize now as well that this Happy New Year celebration and maybe even the ritual with the catfish was all delaying tactics. Yeah. Because after the Katarina Bridge, there will be a tunnel. Yes. And uh, so in this carriage, they turn off the lights and all the guys in balaclavas put on night vision goggles. Like, yes, Dave, you're and, so right. And... Uh, uh, because they didn't need the holes in their faces because the whole idea is that they can see anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Nam says something in South Korean we don't understand and uh, they ask what he said and the little girl goes, oh, he says, you guys are effed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Then the lights go out and we change then to something we don't see very much in the film, but it's a first-person perspective. We see 
um, from the perspective of someone who has the night vision goggles on, just like cutting through the tail sections. There's nothing they can do. Yes. They can't see anything. You see lots of like bits of dead people. You see Minister Mason like looking enthusiastically through like basically night vision opera binoculars. Yes. Just watching the murder, just like looking really happy. And then at one point someone, uh, you see Curtis remembering that the little kid took the pack of matches from Nam in the cryogenic container yes. and they start screaming his name down the train they're saying Chang we need fire we need fire yes. and then you see the little kid running up through the length of the train with uh, like a, a burning torch uh, like in like dungeons or medieval times Yes, and he's running through the train as fast as we can and very soon he gets overtaken by Spud running along the train with his one arm Yes, uh, and he grabs he grabs the torch from him and they light more torches along the way and suddenly the fight is even yeah, uh, yeah, because the, now they can see yeah, as well. The tail sectioners can see as well, and the torches overpower the night vision goggles a little bit initially, so the balaclava guys are blinded. And they fight through really well, and there's a moment where Curtis has to make a choice because he realizes he's kind of about halfway up the carriage, yeah. and his second in command, Jamie Bell, uh, Edgar, has been caught by the younger Franco, who's got like a knife to his throat. Yes. Um, and this is a great moment where you realize that this whole film everything to the right of the screen is moving forward and everything is. to the left is moving backwards. It is, yeah. And you see Curtis standing literally in profile, yeah. looking looking left and looking right. Um, and he decides to go forward and yeah. capture Minister Mason. Exactly. Because that will turn the tide of this battle. And that's the whole point. The whole point is to get to the front. Yeah. You're going to suffer losses. Things are not going to work out well. It's going to be a disaster and you're going to lose your loved ones. Yeah. But you hope that the prize is going to be worked at the very end. Yeah, and when he does do it, uh, Jamie Bell tries to break away from the Franco, but he gets he gets killed. Yeah, uh, he does. And you got you had a feeling earlier in the film that Bell was going to die anyway. Yeah, y- you know, in the sense of it just being bold, just the size of his role. Yeah, just from other films, <laughs> who he is. He's actually a very big actor. This is a smaller film than what he'd be used to. So yeah, yeah, he, he's one of those things. He kind of basically said early on, right? Yeah, I'm going to be there for ten scenes. You're paying me, and I'm checking out. Yeah, yeah um, you know? and when he captures when he captures uh, Minister Mason. Uh, uh, she uh, calls for a surrender of her troops. Uh, so they do take the carriage. Yeah. And uh, there's a moment where um, the younger Franco is running to attack Nam, the the engineer behind the train. Yeah. And um, the little girl, I don't know how she does it because it's not quite in frame, but she sort of flips up a spear. Yeah. And he trips and falls and kills himself on the spear. Uh, and he then grabs her face with his bloody bleeding hand and like tries to kill her, but yeah. he's too weak and like Nam kicks him off anyway. Yeah. But you see then that Franco, the older, yeah. the older guy, sees that it was the girl who killed his younger guy. Exactly. And uh, that's going to be a running thread oh, throughout is, the entire he, he, rest of the yeah, film. Yeah, because he's going to go on a serious mission. Yeah, because he was already an enforcer, but now he's got a grudge. Yeah, now it's personal. He, he, and he's almost beyond enforcer. He, he seems to be one of the, he seems to be almost genetically enhanced. He, yeah, there was a moment during Mason's speech where yeah. Gre- um, uh, Curtis threw his axe at her. Yeah. And one of the Francos very slightly just moved the head of their sledgehammer in way of her face and blocked it like yeah. effortlessly. Effortlessly. It's, it's absolutely, Dave. There, there is a sense that, yeah, they are fighting in a heightened state you, you, you know that, they, that they're that they slightly half a move ahead of everyone else yeah you know and and, and like you say later on in the film we really get the sense of that you yeah. really get to know how hardcore this guy really is and it's great movie shorthand you always have to be worried about men in suits like, yeah oh, always totally. <laughs> and especially those suits because they really look like something from the late 80s early 90s and they just look yeah. like two coke dealers <laughs> sitting, sitting around. they really do they, they really, really do. they're do. just shiny crappy suits you know two like hoods that you pay they're just two shiny crappy people holding hands yes shiny um, crappy people <laughs> <laughs> love it <laughs> uh, then the next, the next, the next um, uh, carriage they get to is like showers and water and stuff. Exactly. And this is where Gilliam John Hurt says to them, uh, you know, have showers, wash away the blood, yeah. which is a which is a big and which moment. is massive big moment for them. Yeah. In, in in a way, this is then them moving through. This is their transition. They're they're slowly now getting to feel and becoming what the people at the front of the train are like. Yeah, yeah, because I don't think these guys have ever washed. Um, and this is also the moment where they believe they've won because they've captured the water carriage, exactly. which was in one of the red letters that if you control the water, you control the train. Yeah. Um, and they also have Minister Mason captured. So they sort of think they've won at this point. Yeah. But that's when Tilda Swindon points out to them that the water doesn't come from that carriage. It comes from the nose of the train. Exactly. As it's breaking through the ice, it's breaking that down and it's just, you know, passed down along. Exactly. So this is essentially just a reservoir and it has no strategic value. No, not at um, all. And this is also a weird moment where 
Um, she's begging him for mercy and she addresses him by his full name, Curtis Everett. Yes. And he's like, why, how do you know my name? And she's like, oh, we know a lot about you. Yeah. So you get some sort of hint that like, yeah, there's more the, of a communication stream than we first thought. Exactly. And you get a hint that uh, maybe Curtis, uh, Curtis believes he is leading revolution, but that one sentence gives us that hint that maybe Curtis is part of a bigger picture. Yeah, that yeah. maybe Curtis isn't leading any revolution, but we're not really sure yet. Yeah, and but Curtis is a bit of an unwilling leader because what yeah. he says now, because he wants Gilliam to continue leading the charge forward. Yes. But what he says, um, uh, Gilliam wants him to lead, but what he says back is, how can I lead if I have two good arms? Yes. Which is kind of, if all we know about arms is that they get smashed off when you misbehave, it doesn't 100% make sense, but it will make sense later. It does, yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, uh, Gilliam says... Also, though, I suppose, if, at that point in the film, why he's saying uh, how could I leave with two good arms is the sense that like he's probably saying to him I've had no loss yeah like yeah I, sh- I should have had a catastrophic loss which would make him more like you but like you say we'll actually learn more as it goes yeah. on yeah um, at this point Gilliam agrees to uh, hold up here in like the shower section and let Curtis go forward and he gives Curtis a grey the ninja uh, to add to his party <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah and one thing he says to uh, uh, to Curtis when he's going forward is saying when you get to the front of the train don't let Wilfred talk Yes. And you're thinking, it's like, oh, maybe Wilfred's like a bit of a snake. But we sort of learn later that's not necessarily the case it is. No, it is. Gilliam is hiding something too. Of course Gilliam is. Because like er- earlier on, at the very beginning of the, 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 uh, the movie, Gilliam is sitting underneath the Wilson industry sign. Yeah. Uh, and you almost think... At the very back of the train. At the very, very, very back. Very, very back. Yeah. And was Gilliam at the very, very front once upon a time, you, you, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the, the party here is trimmed down, um, uh, I don't know, for the sake of ease of use. It's just... Uh, Chris Evans, yeah. uh, your two Koreans, uh, Tanya, whose son was taken, yes, and uh, Grey the Ninja. So, Grey the Ninja. Uh, oh, and Spot. And Spot. And Spot. Right. So we're, we're down to just like six six main characters moving forward. And uh, we get a lovely visual scene where they go into a carriage, which is like a mobile aquarium. Yes. With like fish and sharks and stuff. And this is where we get a real hint as to the true nature of the train. Because uh, Mason says to them, they're very lucky to be tasting sushi because sushi is only served twice a year. Yes. And they go, oh, is it not special? And she goes, no, the train is a closed ecosystem. Exactly. Yeah. Closed ecosystems have to be very carefully managed. Yes. We can only harvest them twice. Otherwise, the whole system will collapse. And you're like, oh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, the, and then that's her whole hint in the sense of it. She's on about sushi. She's also on about humans. Yes. You, you know, that, yes. that literally they have their own harvesting system and growing and harvesting. Um, so we're going to go on next episode to one of your favorite scenes, which is the school carriage propaganda bit. Yes. But we're going to have to keep that for another time. Uh, coming up next, we're going to have Linda McAuliffe with the news. So we'll see you again on Movie Book Club. Thanks very much. No.